And so again, you guys remember that uh, we had a lot of disaster preparedness uh, questions uh, in this year's survey, trying to figure out what is the reality of this on the ground? How is it impacting our folks? And what can we do as an office to better serve you? This has been a really big topic of conversation at the national level. So when our team is going to the national Main Street coordinators meetings, um, the past several meetings that we've had, this has pretty much always come up because it's there's disasters everywhere. They're impacting everybody. And how are we preparing our folks for it, but also how are we responding to it? Um, and I would say we're not where we need to be as an as like either a state program or a national program. Um, but I think we're making we're taking steps to move in the right direction. So uh, uh, you know, kind of to kick us off, you know, the the impact of disasters in Georgia. So in Georgia, we've seen 21 federally declared disasters just in the past 10 years. Uh, nationally, the average amount of disasters, per, federally declared disasters per year is around 18. Um, and this includes everything from hurricanes and fires to ice storms and tornadoes. And just since 2017 alone, Georgia has received more than $647 million in disaster relief just from FEMA. So when we asked you guys, have disasters impacted uh, your community, your downtown district, any in the past five years, about a quarter of you guys said yes, 26%. I will say that the majority of that uh, was in the Southeast, the Southwest, and then the coastal communities, um, which I'm sure if that's where you live, that does not seem like a surprise to you. Um, so when we looked at like what type of disaster is impacting our programs, um, the majority hurricanes, tornadoes, 27%, a lot of that comes from, you know, the hurricanes as well and the severe storms that kind of either um, proceed or follow, um, you know, hurricane weather. And then when we looked at what was the impact from each of those disasters, um, the majority of them was severe or moderate, right? So severe impact to the downtown and the businesses, moderate impact to the downtown businesses. But the reality is any impact, right, is, uh, I was going to say impactful, but it's still more than what we want to see. Um, some of the takeaways from looking at the data and trying to understand it, um, for those communities who were impacted by natural disasters, the majority of them said that the business businesses, your local businesses, needed some type of financial assistance to get back up and running. And that was on all different levels. So that means there was either some local assistance required, some state assistance required, or federal assistance. Um, so it was happening in all three levels. And one of the things that we tend to see is that businesses are under leveraged when it comes to insurance. Um, and that's one of the things that you can work uh, with locally your businesses and also your insurance brokers to make sure that, um, especially if you are in those regions. So, you know, I'm thinking like Macon South, right. And then Macon kind of, um, East, right. So the whole coast regions, 10, 11, and 12, um, making sure that you're having those conversations with your folks about, we are being impacted by disasters more. The impacts are getting more severe depending on the year and the weather and the challenges. And you need to make sure that you've got insurance that properly meets and covers your needs. Um, and the same as same with the cities. So the cities themselves, the ones that were impacted, the majority of them required federal funding um, from FEMA to get back to some level of normal. Um, one of the questions we asked, is there a designated emergency response team that coordinates disaster preparedness efforts in the city? And then the second is, is there a comprehensive disaster plan in place? Now, I will tell, tell you that the reason I ask these questions were very specific because I already know what resources are available, but I wanted to see what the familiarity level was from you guys. Um, and so the reason we added the unknown component is because we, I didn't want you to answer yes or no if you really didn't know. I wanted to truly understand what your level of knowledge and, and awareness was. Um, when you talk about an, a, 
a designated emergency response team that helps coordinate disaster preparedness efforts. Typically, I'm talking about Emergency Management Association, um, but you'll see we had about 37% of folks who had no idea really kind of what that answer is. And then we talk about disaster preparedness plans. Usually uh, that comes down as like something called a hazard mitigation plan. And we had about 41% um, who said, I don't know. I don't know if we have this. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. So here's some things to keep in mind. Every single county and the Columbus Convention and Visitors Bureau, uh, not uh, the Tourism Center in Columbus. So every county and them um, has an emergency management agency in our state. So everybody has one. Um, it is required by state and federal law that if any of your cities or counties want to be able to access any state or federal funding, think GEMA, FEMA funds um, for a natural disaster, they have to have an EMA and they also have to have a hazard mitigation plan. Um, so for those of you who are like, I don't know if we have these, I'm here to tell you, yes, you do. And you have both. So you have an emergency management agency and you also have a hazard mitigation plan. It's just who are they and where do we find them? So the thing about hazard mitigation plans is they are looking at anything that could impact your community and saying, what is likely to hurt us? How is it going to hurt us? How do we prepare to, for it? And how do we respond to it? These plans are, again, required by law, um, and they must be approved by FEMA once every five years in order for you to qualify or even apply for federal or disaster relief funds. So again, if you want to do a declaration um, and receive some of that funding from the federal government to help support you, you have to have a plan and you have to have an agency. Um, and in our state, we have all of those. Um, so what does this mean for downtowns? I will tell you, I've looked at um, Carroll County's um, hazard mitigation plan. I've looked at several from uh, other areas in the region here. Um, most of them you can Google, like they're public facing, you can access them. The state even has its very own hazard mitigation plan. But very rarely is there a specific downtown component. Um, and to me, the reason that's concerning is because when you think about it, our downtowns were built along major thoroughfares. So whether it's rail, um, you know, ports or major transportation thoroughfares, right? Which means that we have more propensity for disasters to occur in or near a downtown district. Um, but, you know, if our plan isn't addressing these things and we're just, you know, kind of glazing over it and focus more on storms or flooding um, or things like that, how are we really preparing our downtown to have a major impact from either an emergency or disaster? And what are we going to do when something like this happens? Um, so the other thing that these plans should be addressing is vulnerable populations. And so again, thinking about who and where are these people in our communities? Where are these most vulnerable populations? Are any of them in or adjacent to the downtown district? And then also considering does downtown serve as a hub or a support system? Do we have a community center? Do we have, um, obviously, most of us have churches, right? Which would be a place that people can go to, a gathering space for support, city hall, county offices and buildings. Um, again, these all become resources during emergencies. So again, taking that into consideration. But one of the kind of like nuggets I want to put out there into your mind to think about is East Palestine, Ohio, their train derailment. So this happened, I believe it was spring of last year. You can see a couple different pictures here. Um, but the bottom right kind of shows you like how this happened in their downtown district. Um, and this looks a lot like a lot of ours, right? We've got fire department downtown. We've got city hall. We've got the police department. And then we've got the actual train line where the derailment occurred. You can see in the top right hand corner what that, um, that impact looked like. All it was was an overheated wheel bearing. 
It wasn't anybody going too fast. It wasn't anybody doing anything technically wrong or illegal. It just is something that can happen. And um, the wheel bearing detectors uh, for their system, they didn't fail in any way. It's just, again, the way the system set up. Um, and there were a lot of challenges. Uh, one of the challenges was that the cars that got derailed detached from the front end. And so the uh, train conductors continued on with missing half of the back end of the train. Um, and so when uh, the volunteer firefighters showed up, um, and they were trying to figure out what was happening, you know, what are, what does this train contain, you know, what's going on here. There was a big disconnect and it took them several uh, hours to be able to identify the chemicals that they were dealing with, which was vinyl chloride, not something you should be inhaling, not something you should be breathing. Uh, the area should have been evacuated uh, in a larger uh, space than it was. But again, because of this lack of communication and knowledge, not to the local community's fault, um, there was a big disconnect here. Um, so my thing is, when I think about something like this, I'm like, oh my gosh, how many, you know, downtowns do we have that have rail lines that go through them? How many have these major corridors that could be impacted by something like this? And I'm here to tell you that your emergency management agency has information and plans on this. They know the types of chemicals that are going, uh, that are being transported on the rail lines through your community. You can do drills, um, you can talk with the fire department and other um, people to say, hey, if these chemicals were to spill, what does that mean for my downtown businesses? What does that mean for the residents here? Would we have to evacuate? What does that evacuation zone look like? How would I communicate that with my businesses? Um, so I'm going to throw up here another little uh, polar quiz for you based off of what I just talked about. And I just kind of want to hear back from you guys. Now, I asked you this same question in the survey, but again, kind of hearing some of this information, I want to see how maybe your thoughts have either changed or stayed the same. Give you one more second. All right, I'm going to share with y'all. All right, so let's see what we got here. Um, I'm surprised, but I'm very happy with that. Um, a lot of people feel that they're very prepared, have robust plans and resources in places. That makes my heart really happy. Um, you know, this is not a surprise right here. Some were prepared, uh, understanding now that there are resources and plans in place, but maybe we just haven't talked about what does this look like in reality, the actuality of like, you know, implementing this. Um, and then again, you know, neutral, unsure of our current state of preparedness. Again, understanding today that yes, we have these here, but how is this all going to come together and work together? Um, so I do have some recommendations and things that um, can help you with this. First and foremost, if you do not have a relationship with your local emergency management agency, I would highly encourage you to reach out. Um, so 90% of our organizations um, across the state, our Main Street programs are housed in local government, meaning you are a government part of a government entity, and it is more way more than appropriate for you to develop a relationship with that emergency management agency. Um, and if you don't even know who that is or where to start, I would say talk to your police chief, talk to your fire chief. Um, they should be able to make that introduction for you um, and help you build that relationship. The other thing that I would encourage you to do is that all emergency management agencies are required to do a certain number of exercises a year. Most of these are called tabletop exercises. And then every couple of years, they have to do a full-blown, full-scale drill. Um, 
but this could be a great opportunity to bring in the local EMA um, to meet with the fire department, the police department, your public works, your communications team within the city, as well as you as the downtown manager and say, if we have a train derailment or a specific thing that is happening within downtown, again, looking at it through the lens of downtown, how are we going to deal with this? And they will guide you through what that looks like. And so everybody has the opportunity to talk about it. Everybody has the opportunity to see what their role would be. And again, to have some of these discussions before we're in the midst of actually having to deal with it in real time, in person. Some of the types of disasters that you could use for your tabletop exercise, especially if you're on the coast, obviously a hurricane is probably, you know, a good safe bet for you. If you're on, you know, the, the bottom of the state, the Thomasville, Bainbridges, Valdostas, I know you guys have had a lot of tornadoes. You're almost like our new tornado alley. Um, that can be really good if you are in other places in the state. I'm thinking like up here where I am, like Villarica, Carrollton, other places like that. Um, Ackworth, where you have a major train line that is going through your downtown, maybe talking about a train derailment is, you know, a, a valuable um, conversation. And then for everybody else, I would also say, and we do not talk about this enough, and it's a scary, scary world that we live in, but something called a mass casualty incident. And so when I say a mass casualty incident, what I'm talking about typically is an active shooter situation. We host a lot of events. And when I looked at the number of people coming to downtown stuff uh, for last year, it was like we hosted over something like 12,000 events and 7 million people came to them in our state. God forbid that something happens at one of our festivals, at one of our concerts, at one of our movie nights or something like that. But again, these are things that we want to be prepared for. We want to have conversations about ahead of time and make sure that we're considering, especially because we are these like hubs for our community, right? We want people to feel safe. We want people to feel included, but that means we also need to be prepared. The other thing I want you to consider um, doing besides establishing a relationship, besides hosting a tabletop exercise, is I want you to think about your disaster communication plan. We all know that Main Street typically ends up being the catch-all for communication, meaning that people are looking to you guys for answers. They're looking to hear you know, about what's happening with the businesses, but the community is also looking for engagement. Um, so what I want you to think about is how do we develop a disaster communications plan? How are we going to communicate this with our merchants when there's this need? And how will we share this information with the community? Because these are two very separate needs. And if you're going to be in Birmingham, I will be actually doing a session on this um, for the national conference on how to create your own disaster communications plan. So um, again, you know, just some great takeaways from today. Um, the other thing I want to say is that just like DCA has our own regional reps, uh, the Georgia Emergency Management Agency has their own field reps too. So they have the state divided into eight different regions, and each one has a field coordinator and a homeland security coordinator. And these guys can come in and support your local EMA and your city too, um, and host and organize and facilitate a tabletop exercise if you need it. So again, if you're having having trouble working or coordinating with your EMA, please let us know. We can help make this connection for you. And these guys can be an incredible resource. Um, I know several of them from our region um, and they do this very regularly. Most of them are from a law enforcement background. Um, they, you know, conduct tabletop exercises. They talk about, you know, disaster preparedness and do presentations on a real regular basis. They can be a great resource. Have a great day. Have a great month. Have a great Easter coming up and we will see you soon.